this course, you know, the material that, that I chose for the course, basically one can summarize it with one definition and four theorems. And out of those theorems, probably the last one is not clear whether we will, we, we, we will be able to cover it. So, uh, of course, kind of starting in maybe half an hour or 20 minutes from now, we'll do everything very carefully. But I thought since this course is so focused, maybe <laughs> just a good idea for in the first 20 minutes just to give you the outline of the whole course. So I'll give you the definition and four theorems that we're going to look at. And this will be more or less the complete summary of the course. There, I will not be explaining some things and I'll pretend to, that you already know everything which may be partially true. And, but, but at least this will be, so the introduction, this will be more or less the course played at very high speed. But then you will see where it begins and where it ends. Right, so the definition. So there is one definition and four theorems, as I said. And um, the definition is the one of a Hamiltonian G space. Now, in fact, uh, for the purpose of this uh, kind of today's introduction, instead of uh, G, which can be kind of more general, we'll just take a torus, meaning <coughs> the product of some copies of S1. So uh, a Hamiltonian T space is the following data. So we have a manifold M together with an action of a torus. We have a two form and we have a map or a function on M with values in the dual of the Lie algebra of the torus, right? So, so this is uh, isomorphic to R to the K. So a function with values in some vector space. And then there are several axioms satisfied. Um, right, maybe the first axiom, we forget about the T action, we forget about this function mu, and we say that M omega is symplectic, which means omega is closed and omega is non-degenerate. If you don't know what non-degenerate means, we're going to be discussing it today in great detail later on. So the second axiom is also uh, very simple. We say that the function mu is T invariant. So mu is T invariant. And the third axiom, which is probably most important of all, um, is an equation. Let me write down this equation and then I perhaps try to explain notation. So in this two form we substitute certain vector fields with a parameter psi and the result is given by exact forms where psi takes values in the Lie algebra of T and well, because we have an action here, once you have an element of this Lie algebra, you can associate to it a vector field on M called fundamental vector field. 
So as I said, like all these things we're gonna see in detail later on in the course, but this is like, there is one, it, 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 truth be told, there is like one big definition in this course and that's, that's this definition. Um, so it may look, if you haven't seen it before, or maybe if you haven't worked with it before, it, 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 it looks very special and somewhat strange, right? However, it turns out to be a very, very successful definition. Of course, what does it mean a successful definition? It means that then there will be kind of really interesting, really nice theorems which follow from this definition, hopefully surprising theorems, very strong theorems. And that's the case. So I will now show you uh, four results, or at least, well, so I will be cheating or maybe skipping details, but, but this definition is very, very good, very nice. Uh, so why, or kind of what are the good, what are the good things? So there will be four theorems about it. Let me start with theorem one. Which goes under the name of symplectic reduction. This is one of the, perhaps, one of the most popular constructions maybe in all of the mass, but well, difficult to say, but this is certainly one construction which is used a lot in different fields. So here I will oversimplify it and I will say the following. Let's define M0, which is a quotient of the fiber of zero under this function, right? So we, this function takes values in the vector space, take the pre-image of zero and let's divide it by the action of t. So the claim is that the result in space, sometimes it's a manifold, sometimes it's a more complicated space, is symplectic. So that's, that's the statement. And um, so this statement gives you a machine to produce symplectic spaces. It turns out that in many situations you can start with uh, some manifold or some space which allows a relatively simple description. So this M can be something manageable and this M0 can be something which is much less manageable, much more complicated. So this is, uh, this is a way to produce complicated symplectic spaces. Um, so theorem two, um, which is called convexity. Oops, sorry. Thank you. Um, it tells you the following. Suppose that M is compact and connected. So then the image of M inside this vector space is a convex polytop. Um, so that, that is uh, an intersection of some half spaces. Um, right, so this gives uh, immediately a link to combinatorics. Uh, so here we were, we were speaking about some very particular geometry, very kind of uh, special type of geometry. And here all of a sudden we have some kind of convex polytops, which is immediately a combinatorial object. Um, well, it's a little bit unfortunate that we have to erase something, but well, probably Probably that's the way it is. I shouldn't write in such a huge lattice. 
Um, so theorem theorem three. Uh, which is called localization, and here I start cheating in a somewhat serious manner. So uh, let's say that n is the dimension of m divided by 2. In particular, of course, it tells you that m is probably even dimensional. That's we're going to discuss in more detail already today. So, and let's consider and let's still assume, as here, from, from now on, let's assume that M is compact and connected. So we're going to look at the integral of M of this uh, top degree form multiplied by a function. And for a function, let's take an exponential of a pairing of mu with some element of Li of t. Let's say this is i of xi. So it turns out that such integrals, which a priori are kind of complicated integrals, right? So these are integrals of some kind of exponential functions over possibly complicated spaces, can be computed as sums of contributions uh, of the points in the fixed point set of T. Here I pretend that this fixed point set is discrete. If it's not discrete, one has to do something about it. And here there will be this exponential function computed at the point M. times some rational function of xi, which also depend on m. So, um, so this, we, we, again, we're going to discuss in detail. So there are very surprising and magical things about such formulas. But um, maybe one analogy that we can already st stress is the analogy with the residue, with the classical residue formula, right? So the residue formula gives you sometimes a very complicated integral as a sum of discrete contributions which are sitting somewhere where your integrand has singularities. Now, there are no singularities. Instead, you have a group action and there are fixed points of this group action, but the idea is the same. You have an integral which a priori may be very complicated and, well, you hope to find an expression given in terms of um, concretely defined contributions sitting somewhere at the fixed points. So this, the right hand side is supposed to be easy, the left hand side is supposed to be difficult. But sometimes people play the other way around. If this, part is manageable, if this part is manageable, maybe you can learn something about the combinatorics on the right-hand side. So, uh, so, this is, um, so this story is used a lot in algebraic topology, in the enumerative geometry, and uh, Physicists like it, so it is also used a lot in quantum field theory. So now finally, theorem four. Again, I'm, I'm not sure, probably we won't have that much time in the course to cover it, but um, especially in the introduction, it's probably good for you to know about it. It is called Q commutes with R, or quantization commutes with reduction. Reduction is, uh, is the reduction from here, from, the, from theorem one. Uh, now, what about quantization? So quantization uh, 
in this context is the following notion. To our Hamiltonian G space, T space, we associate QM, which is an element in the representation ring of the group. Of course, here I, I'm, here I was cheating a little bit. Here I start cheating a lot because kind of one, one, one should be more precise to say how it works. So, but uh, uh, the, the essence is as follows. We associate uh, to this uh, triple or quadruple of data uh, an element of the represent representation ring of M called QM. And uh, well, representations uh, of T, they split into direct sums of irreducible representations. So we can say that this is a sum of uh, Reps of t uh, of the integer coefficients qm of lambda times lambda. So this uh, quantization is defined by the is completely determined by those coefficients. Now the theorem says the quantization commutes with reduction says the following that qm of zero where let's say zero is a trivial representation is equal to Q M zero. Here I need to explain a little bit, right? So M zero is formally speaking not a Hamiltonian T space, right? Because there is a priori nothing which acts on it. But it's okay, I just say that uh, it is acted by the trivial group, right? So it is a Hamiltonian T space with an action of a torus of dimension zero. Well, then uh, for the quantiz quantization will be just an integer, right? So there will be no decompositions in any reducibles. So this is just an integer and this is just an integer. So it does make sense to ask whether these two integers are equal to each other. And this is the statement of the uh, quantization commutes with reduction theorem. So, uh, uh, so this is, uh, of course, a somewhat simplified version that I'm presenting here, but, well, it's, I think, sufficiently representative. And this is used a lot in representation theory and, again, in various parts of physics. So that's the uh, landscape of the results that we are trying to achieve in the course. So as I announced, one definition and essentially like these four um, big theorems. Um, so, you know, maybe a characteristic feature of uh, what we are doing in this course um, this is a little bit again similar to uh, to the beginning of complex analysis where like there are many kind of magical results like the residues theorem and other other results right if you look at different courses in the uh, curriculum of the beginning of studies of mass I think this beginning of complex analysis is, is kind of magic in other parts you need to either work hard or whatever some something something goes wrong, either it's difficult or boring or whatever, like. But complex analysis, well, you just say a spell and some very strong result appears without much work. So I think this, this is a little bit similar, similar to in, in spirit. So hopefully there will be not much of uh, hard work. There will be some work, but like, not extraordinarily hard. And the results are just, just, just marvelous, just as good as uh, you can imagine, right? Maybe uh, before we pass to, uh, to the regular stuff, uh, uh, maybe one word on this strategy. I think, uh, so in some cases, uh, I'll give you all the details, but in some cases it will be more like a survey, especially in the places where one needs to, to work hard to really do it. So it, it will be a kind of combination. I'll try to tell you every time whether we do it 
we are doing it honestly or we are, whether we are kind of cutting corners. All right, so uh, any questions at this point? If not, maybe the, 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 the last thing. Uh, so the, for the today's exercises, you'll see maybe I'll take part of today's exercises to advance a little bit more. At least I, I have some material with which I want to start. And if we don't finish it by the end of the second hour, maybe we continue a little bit in the third hour because anyways, we need it for the exercises. Right. Okay, so uh, now we probably have to erase all this beautiful picture and go to some to much simpler stuff. So today what I want to do, I will explain to you or maybe remind you if you already, probably many of you already have a knowledge of it, is symplectic linear algebra. So today I will be doing linear algebra in a symplectic context. Um, so let's say the will be a finite dimensional vector space over R and omega will be an element in the second exterior power of the dual. Of course, we can also think, so there will be many ways to think about those omegas. So one way, of course, is to say that this is uh, a bilinear skew-symmetric map from V cross V to R. Right, so that's, that's one option. Um, so this also means omega of x, y if minus omega of y, x for all x, y, and v. And um, it is convenient to introduce a subspace of V which is a kernel of omega. So these are all axes and V such that omega of x, y vanishes for all i in V. So that's so that's the kernel of omega. Now the uh, main definition of symplectic linear algebra says the following. So, so this pair V omega, a vector space together with a skew symmetric bilinear form is called symplectic. if the kernel of omega is trivial. So we have a skew-symmetric form with trivial kernel. Uh, maybe one small remark about this definition. So I wrote omega of x, y is equal to zero, placing x in an element of the kernel in the first place and the element, arbitrary element of v in the second place. But of course, it's the same as to say omega of yx equal to zero, that's just because of the skew symmetry condition. So that's equivalent. Right. So, um, uh, as I said, so the, we will have various interpretations for omega. 
So here omega up to now was uh, uh, a bilinear form or skew-symmetric bilinear form. Now let's do the following. Let's introduce a map uh, called omega flat. And this will be a map from V to V star, uh, which is defined by the following formula. So omega flat of x is equal to omega of x, and then we leave one argument free, right? So this is some a linear form on V. Now the first uh, very simple proposition says the following. V omega is symplectic if and only if omega flat is an isomorphism. Um, I must say when preparing this lecture, um, I wrote up a proof and then I put it in some kind of parenthesis. I, I, I don't know, maybe it's too easy. But okay, since that's our first proposition, let's still, even, even if it's very easy, let's, uh, um, let me give a proof. The proof is more or less uh, tautological. So um, we have V omega symplectic. This means that the kernel of omega is zero. So this means uh, this subspace is zero, right? So that's just the definition. Um, that's just the definition of this kernel of omega. Uh, but now um, let's write the definition of the uh, kernel of omega flat. So kernel of omega flat, right? So these are uh, these are such axes in V with a property uh, that this linear form omega of x dot is zero, right? But uh, what does it mean that this uh, linear form is zero? This means it vanishes on all vectors. So this, so this is like tautologically the same thing. So, so this is this is the same as kernel of omega flat is zero. And since V and V do have the same dimension, uh, if uh, the kernel is zero, then omega flat is an isomorphism. Um, okay, so perhaps some small remarks about this uh, omega, omega flat construction. Well, again from um, elementary linear algebra, we know that the double do of our vector space is isomorphic, canonically equal to the vector space we started with. And so we can play the same game in the other direction. We can consider some element, let's call it pi in vetch two of V. And we can define a map 
Traditionally, it's called now pi sharp, uh, which is a map from v star to v, uh, which will be defined just by the, uh, well, by, by the formula analogous to, to the one we had before. So pi sharp of psi is equal to pi of psi dot. So here we use the identification of V with its double dual, right? So that's just, just the same story now with star and no star exchanged. Um, and now in terms of in terms of this dual construction, we can formulate the following proposition. Um, so V omega is symplectic if and only if there is a unique pi in wedge to V such that Omega flat and pi sharp are inverses of each other. In particular, of course, pi sharp has to be, if uh, this equation to be true, pi sharp better be invertible as well, right? Um, um, again, I... Uh, had a little bit of doubts whether I should give a proof. Uh, but then I, uh, I realized that when I wrote up a proof, it was maybe not very beautiful. So, so I, I'm not sure that's an optimal proof. Maybe you can. So I'll give you my proof. And then if you can find a better proof, more elegant proof, that would be nice. Um, all right, so how do we prove that? Um, so the first thing to see um, uh, obviously this uh, omega flat minus one, right? So that would be a map from V star to V is is well defined. So that's because omega flat um, is an isomorphism by the previous proposition, right? Um, so if, if that's the case, then it is more or less obvious that there is a unique pi in V tends of V, such that pi sharp defined by this formula is equal to Omega flat minus one. Uh, why is that? Well, that's because, right, what, 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 what does this formula do for you? It defines for you maps from V star to V. And now if you take this uh, full tensor product of V tensor V, so any map from V star to V will be encoded by such an element. So that's, that's kind of linear algebra, right? So this. Uh, so obviously, in this uh, tensor product of v times v, so there is there is such a pi which would verify this property. So uh, basically, we need to show that it's go it's skew it's going to be skew symmetric. So we need to show that it's skew symmetric. Um, right. So let, let's just compute. Let's just choose two elements 
sine eta in v star, uh, v star and let's compute pi of psi eta. Now by definition, um, what, what, what is it? I think by definition that's eta computed on omega flat minus one of psi. Is it, uh, is it true what I'm saying? Or, or the other way around, let's, let's see. Could you uh, write so, uh, right, so this will be omega psi, right. And then when we add eta here, we take, uh, we take a duality with this element. Now, uh, you know, again, uh, omega flat is an isomorphism. Uh, so, this means that you can rewrite eta as an image of some element, let's say y of v, and psi is an image of some element, let's say x. So x and y are in v. Well, then uh, what does it give? So here. So this would give omega flat of y. And here omega flat and the flat, flat minus one, they will cancel out. So here we'll have psi. And uh, I think that's, that's just the definition, uh, sorry, this will be just x. And I think that's just the definition of omega of yx, right? Now, of course, we know that omega of yx is minus omega of xy. And then just uh, uh, repeating the argument in the other direction, this will be pi of minus pi of eta xi. So this means that pi will be necessarily skew symmetric. Um, so let me finish this hour by giving you two examples. And then we continue with the third example after the break. So the first example that I guess everybody knows, we consider V to be the space uh, R to N. Uh, we consider, say, the basis of this space, which is split into two equal halves. So the first n vectors, let's call them E1 through En, and the, 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 n second, the, n, the second half from F1 to Fn, and uh, we define, let me call it omega zero, the, the standard symplectic form, so omega zero, which vanishes on pairs of elements E i e j or F i F j and omega of E i F j is equal to the Kronecker delta. So it's one if the indices coincide and it's zero if they're different. So that's one standard example. Of course, strictly speaking, one needs to check that it is symplectic, but well, I leave you on this. If you, if you, if you never checked such a thing, yeah, let's, so please do check it, but otherwise that's, 
That's an easy check. Now, let's say the second example. In fact, all the examples, they are variations of each other. So the second example, uh, let's start with L. <coughs> a finite dimensional vector space over R and dimension of L is equal to N. Uh, let's take V to be a direct sum of L and its dual. Uh, and let's define the symplectic form well, in the end, it will be the same symplectic form if kind of so I take a liberty to still call it omega zero. So, and I define it on PS, X plus Xi and Y plus eta as, uh, so there is basically up to a sign the only natural skew symmetric combination that you can write. So here x and y are in L and xi and eta are in L star. So xi is paired to y and x is paired to eta and I need to choose different signs. So I, I, I made this choice but of course you can make another choice. Also you can multiply it by an arbitrary coefficient. So again, well, strictly speaking, one needs to check that um, this form is symplectic, but it's an easy exercise. Well, uh, let's have a break and let's continue with the next example after the break. So should we continue? Right, so the um, next example. So we gave two uh, very simple examples of uh, symplectic, of symplectic vector spaces. Let me give you one more example. So let's start with H. Again, a finite dimensional vector space but this time over C. So a complex vector space. And let's assume that this is a Hermitian vector space. So there is a Hermitian form. So uh, recall that, so it's linear in one argument, anti-linear in the other one, and it has the property that when you exchange the arguments, you get a complex conjugation. Now, I don't quite know what about in which argument is it linear and in which anti-linear. I think in physics and in mathematics, uh, the, the, the uh, notation is different. And because of my difficult physics childhood, I sometimes prefer the phys physics notation where uh, it's linear in the second argument and anti-linear in the first one. But in, in mass, usually you would say it's linear in the first one and anti-linear in the second. So it, it's kind of negotiable. Um, right, so it's a Hermitian form. Uh, and in particular, so this is true and h of xx is greater or equal to zero and it is equal to zero if and only if x is zero. Now what is V? So V will be the same thing as H as a set, but we want to think of it as a real vector space now. So a vector space over R. In particular, if here the dimension of H is equal to N, then the dimension of V is equal to 2N. And we define <coughs> V 
yeah, we define omega of x, y as the imaginary part of h of x, y. Um, so it, it turns out to be skew symmetric. So this is uh, this is relatively obvious, right? So we take omega of uh, y x equal to the imaginary part of h y x, and well, here it's handy to have this complex conjugation property. So it's h x y bar, and of course the imaginary part of it is minus the imaginary part of h of x, y, which is minus omega of x, y. Now, uh, what about the kernel? Why, why the kernel is 0? So let's take some vector x, which is non-zero. And let's compute omega of x let me just here write it, whatever, yeah, x i x. So, so this is another vector of h, but you know, in h they are proportional to each other. In v, not really, right? So because we, we see v as a real vector space, so these are, these are two vectors uh, which are linearly independent, and this is the imaginary part of h x i x. Now we really have to decide. Let me for a moment think that it is linear in the second argument. Doesn't matter so much, but so then it will be imaginary part of i h of x x. Well, h of x x is real, so the imaginary part is h x x. And uh, if x is non-zero, h of x x is non-zero. Right? And this means x is not in the kernel of omega. So the kernel of omega only has 0, and this means v omega is symplectic. Right. Of course, well, you can work it out. Uh, so the first example and the second example and the third example, this is more or less all the same example. And we'll see it in more detail later today. Right. Maybe one more. Uh, one more small definition. So, um, Maybe let's start with a remark. Uh, so we see omega as an element of which 2 v star. But in principle, we can also think of it um, as a two form on v with constant coefficients, right? We can also think of it Two form on V, which is constant or constant coefficients. Right. So now I would like to introduce. Uh, let me go here. I would like to introduce the uh, symplectic group associated to a pair v omega. And uh, this will be elements of the general linear group of v, so invertible endomorphisms of v. And now I would like to 
write the following equation, right? So uh, an endomorphism of V, if I think of V as a manifold, right? It's uh, in particular a diffeomorphism of V. And this means that if I have a two form on V, I have a well-defined pullback, right? So, so one short way or economic way to say it, I take my constant coefficient two form, I pull it back under this uh, linear transformation, you get another constant coefficient two form and we require them to be the same. Right? Okay, so this is a useful notion and of course we'll develop it further later on. Uh, perhaps um, now it's good time uh, for a new series of definitions. So the, up to now we worked with the vector space together with a two form. And linear algebra also uh, usually brings to our attention subspaces. So vector subspaces or vector space. So let's see how, what's the interplay with the two form of those subspaces. Uh, so first of all, let's say U in V is a subspace. And then we define another subspace. Let's call it U omega. And these are vectors of V such that omega of xy is zero, so all these definitions, they resemble to each other, but now y is an element of u. So it's a kind of omega orthogonal. Um, it should be compared with a definition, so this is, this is a subspace of v. So, so it should be compared to the standard definition from linear algebra of uh, U orthogonal, which is a subspace of the dual space, right? So these are, these are what? These are such size. Let me denote again by Y an element of U, which vanish on all the elements of U. So in fact, um, um, right, let me, how do I want to state it? Okay, let me start with a remark and then, um, and then let, me, let me state a simple proposition. So let me act by omega flat on this guy, u omega, right? So if I send elements of u omega by omega flat to v star, then, well, there is the following formula. Uh, omega flat x y is equal to omega x, y. So if I say that psi is an image of x, so then this expression is exactly equal to that expression, right? So this suggests the following proposition. The image of u omega under this isomorphism, omega flat, is exactly equal to uh, u orthogonal. So why is it true? Um, so I think here, uh, is it? Mm, yeah, but here I think, I think we actually proved it, right? I would say. Is it, is it at this point maybe, right, so this, so this, this, this was more or less the proof. Right. Uh, 
Um, maybe I, um, I would like to add a remark on the dimensions, right? So this tells us that the dimension of u omega is equal to the dimension of u orthogonal because omega flat is an isomorphism, right? So the dimensions should be the same. And by the standard linear algebra mantras, so this is the dimension of v minus the dimension of u. So that's the dimension of u orthogonal. Now maybe one more very simple very simple statement. If you take the orthogonal twice, you get back the subspace that you started with. And um, well, why is that? Um, I think it is obvious that u is contained and u omega omega. That's because uh, what, is, what is u omega omega? So these are what? These are axes in V such that omega of x, y is equal to zero for all y in u omega, right? But if you take an x in u, right, then omega of x, y is zero for y in u omega. That's by definition of u omega. So this is Obvious from, from the definition. Um, so, but, but then on the other hand, we have the dimension formula. So the dimension of this u omega omega, this is the dimension of v minus the dimension of u omega. And this is the dimension of v minus the dimension of v minus the dimension of u. And this is the dimension of u. But then if one subspace is contained in the other and they have the same dimension, well, they have to be the same. Right. Um, right. OK. Yeah. Sorry, I'm kind of always running between my notes and the blackboard. Somehow haven't memorized my course well enough. Um, now comes a nice definition. Uh, so we're going to have some kind of classification uh, of uh, subspace of, or symplectic vector space, classifying them into different types. So suppose V omega is symplectic and U and V is a subspace. So then we say that U is isotropic if U is contained in U omega. U is co-isotropic if U omega is contained in U, so if it's the other way around. Um, U is Lagrangian if they coincide, meaning that U is both isotropic and co-isotropic, and I have one more point that I perhaps write here. U is symplectic if U intersection with U omega 
is zero. So it's not true that all the subspaces, they fall into one of the categories, right? So this is not a kind of classification, but these are like big types. Maybe one, one simple remark here, if U is isotropic, then U omega is quasitropic, and if uh, the other way around is U is quasitropic, then U omega is isotropic. So they kind of there is a kind of duality between isotro isotropic and quasitropic, and in particular, of course. In the Lagrangian case, this will be an auto-duality, so there is no second subspace. Right, so what do we do with this uh, classification? So maybe, uh, maybe just one example before if we go on and state our first important statement in the course. So let's say example. So recall there was there was an example of symplectic vector spaces which are built as direct sums of uh, L and L star with the form with the standard symplectic form omega naught. So in this case, it's easy to check that both L and L star uh, isotropic, quasitropic, and as a consequence, Lagrangian. Maybe, maybe I still write this formula again. So, psi y minus eta x. And um, in this formula, it's uh, relatively easy to see that they're actually uh, isotropic. Quasitropic, perhaps slightly more tricky, but isotropic, this is obvious because, uh, for instance, L is isotropic because if you take an element, two elements of L, so this would be X and Y, so Xi and Eta are zero, then the right-hand side is just identically zero. Or if we put x and y equal to zero, the left is psi and eta, then again, the right-hand side is automatically zero. So there is nothing left there, right? So if you take any pair of them to be zero, then the right-hand side vanishes, right? Okay, so now um, I still go with the proposition because it's very easy, but this is uh, in fact a linear algebra baby version of theorem one of the introduction. Um, so let me um, give it a name. Um, so it's um, linear linear reduction lemma. Right. So, so the setup is usual. We have V omega symplectic, and we have U in V, which is isotropic, right? Okay. So then, uh, let me call it W, at least for the purpose of this uh, proposition. Um, so let's take a quotient of u omega mod u. It is well defined because it, it makes sense because u is a subspace of u omega. So we take a quotient of u omega by u and we claim that it is, is symplectic uh, with the uh, bilinear form defined by the following formula. So here I hesitate a little bit how, what, what the notation will be. Maybe at least temporarily, let me, let me call it omega bar. I'm, I'm not sure that's an ideal notation. I, I would love to call it omega zero, but omega zero is already occupied. So 
a mega bar uh, of x, y, right? So that's a quotient space, so I, I, I should define it on the classes. Uh, and I just define it by the most naive formula saying that it's just equal to omega of x, y, and here x and y are in u omega. Right. So that's, um, so we look at the quotient space and we claim that the two form descends to the quotient space and that it is non-degenerate on the quotient space. As I say, that's, uh, we'll see now the proof. It's, uh, it's an elementary statement from linear algebra. Um, uh, but it's a baby version. Basically, that's, that's where the, uh, the first theorem that we aim at is coming from. So that's the... Um, all right, so first of all... Um, So we need to see that it is well defined. This is more or less obvious, right? So assume that we have uh, x prime equal to x plus a and y prime equal to y plus b with uh, a and b in u. So then omega of uh, x plus a, y plus b, so I take different representatives. So this will be omega of x, y, plus omega of xb plus, there will be two more terms. Now this uh, omega of xb, so this guy is in u omega, so this guy is in u. But then by definition of u omega, this is zero, right? So, uh, so this, is, this is zero. And the same happens to all the other terms. So this means that omega, so the restriction, maybe, maybe one mathematically more developed phrase would be the following. What we see here that the restriction of omega to u omega descends to u omega mod u, right? So it defines a two form, a bilinear, a bilinear form on u omega mod u. Now, omega bar is q, so this is obvious, right? Omega was q, omega bar will be skew. Um, now the question is, what about the kernel of omega bar, right? The, the main claim of the simple claim by the claim of the linear reduction lemma is that the kernel of omega bar will be zero. So uh, let's assume that x is in the kernel of omega bar. So what does it mean? Uh, it means that uh, omega bar of x, y is equal to zero for all y in u omega. And this means that omega x, y is equal to zero for all y in u omega. But this means that uh, x 
belongs to u omega omega, right? That's just the definition of u omega omega. But u omega omega is equal to u. So this means that x belongs to u, but x belongs to u, this means that the class of x is zero to start with. So if the class of x is in the kernel of omega bar, this means that this class is zero, and this means w omega bar is symplectic. So what I want to say right up to now, so that's, that's one of these, it, it, it happens often in linear algebra. Uh, so we had like very incremental steps, very like every step was like really trivial. I mean, so by induction, this is also trivial, right? However, as I say, this is already an important building block in our future building of moment maps. Right. Okay. So now I would like to switch the focus a little bit and concentrate a little bit more on Lagrangian subspaces. So here we discuss, so we introduce different types of subspaces and now we want to discuss in a little bit more detail uh, Lagrangian Lagrangian subspaces. So let me state the next proposition. Suppose that V omega is symplectic. Then um, the, the statement is that actually uh, there are Lagrangian subspaces in V. So there exists at least one L and V Lagrangian. And it turns out that the dimension of V is twice the dimension of L. In fact, the first statement will, will have to prove in some way, but if the first statement is correct, the second statement is obvious, right? So, so if L in V Lagrangian, then uh, we know that the dimension of L is equal to the dimension of L omega because they, they are just the same. And this is the dimension of V minus the dimension of L. And this uh, directly gives us the dimension formula. So if uh, Lagrangians exist at all, then this formula holds and in particular, dimensions of V are even, right? So this, this is automatic once. So this, this is basically some kind of um, obvious statement. Now why, uh, why Lagrangians exist? Um, here there will be perhaps several steps, but the first step is to notice that non-trivial isotropic subspaces exist. Because if one takes any non-zero vector in V and considers a line spanned by this vector, so this line is clearly isotropic. So this is because X is Q symmetric, so omega of X, X vanishes. And this means that 
Rx is contained in Rx omega. So isotropic subspaces, non-zero, non-trivial isotropic subspaces, they do exist. Now we can introduce a partial order on on isotropic subspaces just by inclusion. So an isotropic one isotropic subspace is smaller than the other if uh, if it is included in the other subspace, right? It's clearly a partial order. Now, consider maximal consider maximal isotropic subspaces. So isotropic subspaces which cannot be included in any other bigger isotropic subspace. Those exist, um, so they exist because the dimension of V is finite, right? So you cannot, like, if you, if you take an isotropic subspace and it's not maximal, you increase the dimension by one and so on, but you cannot go above the dimension of V because they are subspaces of V. So the maximum isotropic subspaces do exist. Now, uh, the claim is so if L Is maximal isotropic, then it is Lagrangian. Um, so, what if not? So I assume we have L, which is maximal isotropic, but not Lagrangian. And W equal to L omega mod L. is non-zero, right? So it's, it's maximum isotropic. In particular, it is isotropic. It is sitting, so L is sitting inside L omega, but they are not equal to each other. So the quotient is a non-trivial vector space. OK. So uh, then do the following. Uh, choose a non-zero element in W, and uh, consider L prime to be L plus Rx. In fact, because the class of X is non-zero, this is a direct sum. Right? So this line is not inside <coughs> L. So this is actually a direct sum. Um, so I claim that uh, this um, subspace is isotropic. Um, indeed, what are the vectors here? So the vectors here are of the form A plus uh, alpha x with A in L and alpha in R. And if I compute omega 
of A plus alpha X, B plus beta X. So what do I get? Well, I get the terms of the form omega AB, which is zero because L is isotropic, plus alpha beta omega of X, X, which is zero by skew symmetry. And I'll have two mixed terms, alpha of omega XB plus beta of omega AX, uh, sorry, yes, omega AX. And these terms are equal to zero because X is in L omega and A and B are in L. So because of that, all these terms, they vanish. So this is zero and this is zero. So this means that, um, so this means that L prime is isotropic and dimension of L prime is equal to the dimension of N and L prime contains L. So this contradicts our assumption that L is maximal, so this is a contradiction. And because of this contradiction, we see that L actually is Lagrangian. So Lagrangian subspaces Lagrangian subspaces do exist. Um, so again, I'm not completely sure. Maybe towards the end, my arguments are kind of, my feeling is they are slightly too complicated. Maybe you, you should be able to phrase it like in one line instead of four. Um, let me continue with another proposition about Lagrangian about Lagrangian subspaces. So again, V omega is symplectic. L in V is now Lagrangian. So we know that they we know that they exist. So then there is another subspace, let's call it M in V. Also Lagrangian, such that V is represented as a direct sum of L and M. So Lagrangians exist very well, but actually for Lagrangian, you can always find a complementary Lagrangian. Uh, so let's see um, why this is true. So this is of course the same as For dimension reason, right, that's the same as intersection of L and M is zero. Um, so in fact, the proof goes along the same lines as the previous one. Now we do the following. We now consider Isotropic subspaces, let's say F or U, U and V, such that the intersection of U and L is zero, right? So they exist. They exist because if you take any vector x, which is not an L, and those exist for dimension reasons, 
and yeah, right, not an L, then the line spanned by X is such an isotropic Lagrangian subspace. Now, in a similar fashion, we make a claim. If u is maximal isotropic, again, we introduce the same partial order with uh, u intersection L0. Then u is actually Lagrangian. Uh, so the proof is a version of the proof that we saw before. And I think I probably leave it as an exercise. So this, now, now you have to complete the proof. And that's for, for that, that basically would be a version slightly more like or whatever. It will be, will be a version of this proof. Right. Um, I suggest to make a break. And after the break, I would like to still take maybe um, 10, 15 minutes for two more statements. And then after that, I'll leave Flora and the floor for exercises. And maybe you kind of, we, we prepared an exercise sheet for today and next week. Because next week, we, we, we want to use the same material for the exercises. So then you can start with the simple ones today and then more complicated ones you have one week to look at them and then maybe we discuss them next week. All right, so let's have a break. Right, okay, so let's continue for some more minutes with the, with the course. And one of the reasons uh, that, that I want to, to take this time from exercises because I want to state the first theorem of the course and um, it says the following. Um, so let's say V omega is symplectic. Then it is isomorphic R to N omega zero, we have had a description of the standard symplectic structure on uh, R to N, <coughs> of course, for N equal to the dimension of V over two. So why is it true? So we more or less, the previous proposition prepares this step so we know that V is a direct sum of L and M with L and M with L and M Lagrangian. Now, um, let's think about the following. So M injects into M injects into V. And now omega flat maps V to V star, right? So that's an isomorphism. And uh, V star projects. Of course, V star would be again a direct sum of L star and M star. And for instance, we can consider projection of V star to, to L star. Um, so one more. One more exercise is to, to check that this is actually 
an isomorphism. So this car composition turns out to be an isomorphism map from induced from M to L L star. So in fact, um, so M is isomorphic to L star, and of course L is isomorphic to M star. So this isomorphism is uh, given by omega flat, and so so which means that, let me recall that omega flat, if, if it takes some x in M, it maps it to the linear form omega of x dot, viewed as a linear as a linear form on L. Uh, now let's just do the following. Choose Choose a basis, let's say E1, En, in M. Uh, or maybe, do I want it in L? Uh, no, let's, let's say in L. And dual basis. F1, Fn in M, which is isomorphic to L star. So then uh, L and M are Lagrangian and in particular isotropic. So this means that the formulas that we want for omega on the pairs of elements of L or on the pairs of elements of M, this is zero because L and M are isotropic. So that's because and the last formula that's because of this uh, choice of the dual basis and because of the definition of the duality right so the the duality is given by omega so omega of F, fj is equal to delta ij. That's because we chose a dual basis and because this duality is exactly given by, by this formula. And that's exactly the definition of the standard uh, symplectic form or st standard symplectic structure on R2n. So with this choice of the basis, uh, we, can, we can always identify V with R2n with omega zero. Uh, in particular, such basis uh, which consist of P's and F's. So they are sometimes called symplectic or canonical basis. Here the word symplectic is probably somewhat better on the mass side because canonical somehow it indicates that it should be in some way unique, but it is highly non-unique. So that's, that's the word which just comes traditionally. It's, it's, against the, um, it's against the rules to use it, but still sometimes people use it and we're probably gonna use it from time to time. Um, I would like to finish with one more proposition. So you see the, in this symplectic linear algebra, we tried to explore different facets of omega. So let me recall, omega was a skew symmetric uh, form. Omega is also in induces this map, this uh, omega flat. Also, omega has some kind of inverse, this, this guy pi, together with its, uh, the corresponding map pi sharp. And now I would like to introduce one more, one more facet. So V omega is symplectic, meaning that omega has no kernel if and only if uh, uh, the form of degree to n, omega to the n divided by n factorial 
is non-zero. So that's, that's an element of veg to n v star where n is as usual three dimension of uh, dimension of v over two. So this is a form of top degree. So it can be either zero or non-zero, right? This forms of top degree, this is just one line. And we want to know whether, whether it's zero or non-zero. And uh, n factorial is of course just historic or whatever, like just for convenience. We can, you can drop n factorial if you, if you want. Uh, this is a very important object in symplectic geometry called the Liouville volume form. And let's see why, uh, why it works this way. Um, so, right. So suppose, like, let, let me prove it in the following way. Suppose that the kernel of omega is non-zero. So suppose that the omega is actually not symplectic, right? Well, then there is a non-vanishing element in V such that omega of x dot is zero. And then uh, what we can do, we can uh, consider, right, the uh, for you, you, you would understand, right, this, this language. I, I would like now to make a contraction. Was it yota or what, what was the notation? That, so I, I would like to make a contraction of the Liouville form, right? Liouville form is the degree 2n form and I want to contract it with a vector x. Is it? So this is equal to, by definition, L of x dot dot dot. Right, so I, I, I insert the, the, this vector x. Now, uh, since we have this formula, then uh, I think it's going to be what? It's going to be probably omega of x dot times omega n minus 1 over n minus 1 factorial. Is it like, I, th I think you, you had some exercises with differential forms that I was told were easy. Right? So, so it's, it's like, like, like a differentiation. You, you take a derivative of omega to the end, so it is omega times omega n minus 1 and times n, so which cancels the, the n factorial. So this is 0. This is 0. But then uh, for a top degree non-zero volume form, inserting any vector which is non-zero gives you non something which is non-zero, right? So if, if this is zero, this means L is actually equal to zero. Right? So, so if, if the kernel of omega is non-zero, then L is zero. Now what if the kernel of omega <coughs> is zero? <coughs> Well, if the kernel of omega is zero, then V omega is symplectic. V omega symplectic means that V omega is isomorphic to R to N omega naught. So now we just need to check that this guy is non-zero. Uh, so let me write it in the following way. Um, so we, we now have a preferred basis in V. So this preferred basis consists of E's and F's. Now, of course, there is a dual basis There is a dual basis in V star that I denote by the same letters with a star over them. Uh, now, omega zero, so this is an element in veg, veg two V star, 
And what is it as an element? So that we can read from our formulas, right? So this is a sum i from 1 to n. And here we'll have e star veg f star, right? So that's, that's what we simply read from these formulas. Now let's just compute L0, which is omega 0 to the power n over n factorial. Well, uh, the thing is easy, right? So we, we, we take the sum, we take the nth power, we, ta we, we take the binomial formula, and in the binomial formula, uh, right, we are not allowed to repeat the terms twice. So each of these terms will come up only once. And then, well, kind of as we learned in the first year, there are n factorial such terms, which will happily cancel the n factorial in the definition. And so as a result, we'll just get a product from 1 to n, e i star veg f i star. And this is just a product of all the basis vectors of the dual basis, which is uh, obviously non-zero, right? So I showed that if kernel is non-zero, then L is zero. If the kernel is zero, then L is non-zero. And I think this settles the matter. All right, so uh, I think at this point, we stop with the exploration of uh, symplectic linear algebra. There, there, is, there is a lot more stuff there, and part of it will be covered by the exercises, and perhaps pa parts of it will kind of show up later in the course. But uh, next time, we're gonna do some geometry. So I think that that's it for a moment for linear algebra. And with this, I pass the word to Florian.